Good morning. Good to have all of you here at Living Water today. I'm excited about getting into God's Word. If you have a Bible or a mobile device with you, you can click open in your favorite Bible application or even download our app. All the notes you see here on the screen will be already typed up for you. You can follow along, email them to yourself later if you'd like to do that. But we're going to get into today's message as we continue our series full of it. Come on, man. God wants us to be full of it. I don't know if you remember this, but two weeks ago... When I was up here, I might have looked a little tired, like in the eyes, in the face, because what you don't know is before I got up to preach, I had a severe lack of sleep due to all of the smoke detectors in our house going off at 2 in the morning, and I couldn't go back to sleep afterwards. All of the smoke detectors, Saturday night, middle of the night, Sunday morning, early, we all of a sudden, meh. And they're all like hardwired together. So if one goes off, they all go off. Uh, I mean, that's good if there's a fire, but if it's not, it's very inconvenient. My wife and I hop out of bed. We're running around the house sniffing. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty ridiculous. You know, I mean, I wear glasses. I didn't put my glasses on or nothing. I'm just walking around in my pajamas. <sighs> going down in the basement, look at the furnace, make sure there's nothing on fire down there. Nothing. Nothing in the whole house, man. Nothing, nothing going on. We, go, we, we come to church, we're tired, we, we get a nap, we're good. Go to bed on Sunday night, middle of the night, Sunday night, all of the smoke detectors go off again. Going around the house, smelling this time we're a little bit less concerned. Nothing. Go back to sleep. The next night, I'm not kidding you guys, Monday night, all of a sudden, smoke detectors all going off. I went Tuesday, changed out all the smoke detectors in the house. Just went, bought all new smoke detectors, changed them all. It had something to do with like the humidity in the air and the smoke detectors were old and they needed to replace all. Long, long story. But when I was returning to rechange them, put new batteries in them, I noticed that written on the smoke detector is this phrase right here. It says, please test weekly. You're supposed to test your smoke detectors every week, you guys. Now, I just need a show of hands here. Are you so good at following the rules that you test your smoke detectors once a week? Can I see your hand? Can I recognize you and just <laughs> applaud you for your abnormal rule following? That, that nobody, nobody checks their smoke detectors once a week. Are you kidding me? I don't know if I've ever tested a smoke detector except for the time when you install it and you just want to make sure, ah, it's working, it's working. If you've ever put a new battery in, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what's funny is God gives us a way that we could test him. In fact, God's word gives us some instructions that says you should test me. You should test me at a regular basis as a matter of fact. Every time that we receive any financial increase, God says, I want you to test me. I want you to see that I'm faithful and that I'll take care of you. It says it like this in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. And then he says, come on, test me. So when we bring the whole tithe, we get an opportunity to test God. Here's what he says. He says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't have room enough for it. He says, you're going to be full of it. <laughs> when you test me, you're going to be full of blessing. Yes. Young's literal translation in this verse right here says, do, I, do not I open to you the windows of heaven, yea, I have emptied on you a blessing until there is no space. This is the kind of life that God wants us to live, not only the last few weeks in our lives, and I want you to just hear what God says about it today. Can we pray as we get into God's word? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promises. God, we thank you that all of your promises are yes and amen in Christ. And God, we believe it by faith. God, we walk in it by faith, and we receive every good thing that you want to bring to us today. God, bring revelation of your word to our hearts so that we can walk in obedience and experience your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. I love God's word. Not only in the Old Testament, because Malachi, Malachi is in the Old Testament, but a New Testament version of this idea is found in Philippians chapter 4. Paul says it like this. And my God will meet 
all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That's a, that's a great promise verse right there. That's one of those promises that you write down and that you memorize and that you speak over your life, over your future, over your children. You say, my God is able to meet all of my needs. He, he will do it. He's able to do it. And he's going to do it because he said that he would. My pastor, when I was growing up in the faith, he would say, this is the 419 promise. This is Philippians 419. And he would say, we have this promise over our church that God's going to meet all of our needs, all of the jobs that we have a need of, all of the applications that we turn in, everything, college tuition, God's going to meet all of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now get this, what he says in verse 20. He says, to our God and Father be glory. So I want you to make a connection here. When God meets all of our needs, guess what happens? God gets glorified. When God meets all of our needs, God receives the glory because you and I walk around as Christians wearing the name of Jesus. We are marked as Christians, as Christians, Christ followers. And when we wear the name of Jesus, God says, you're not going to defame my name by living at a lower place than what I've called you to. No, you're wearing my name, and I want all the people on the earth to know that I'm a good God who pours out abundant grace and gives more than enough. I'm the God who meets all of your needs. I like to say it like this. Right like this, right here. God is glorified when we are fully supplied. God is glorified. To him be the glory when he meets all of our needs in Christ Jesus. When you have all of your needs met, it reflects on him and his character. Now, what I want you to know about this message today is we're going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, understanding the context of the scripture. And some people say, oh, well, tithing is Old Testament, and this is Old Testament. Here's what I want you to know. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians that all of God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. Which means that through Jesus fulfilling the law of Moses for us, everything that applied to a benefit that came from the law now is fulfilled in Christ and it benefits us. So we get to walk in these promises. So these promises that we're reading from the book of Malachi, it applies to us in faith because we know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law on our behalf. And we have access to his promises. So the book of Malachi is, is fairly unique, and I want you to kind of follow along with me for a second, because we're going to kind of go a rapid pace through the entire book, and then we're going to land in chapter 3, where we read just a moment ago. Now, Malachi, the book of Malachi starts out where God is prophesying here through the, Malachi the prophet, and it says, a, a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. So this is what the whole book of Malachi is, a word from God to Israel, which is a nation through the prophet Malachi. And here's what he writes right here. He says, I have loved you, says the Lord. So he starts out this book and he says, hey, before I bring any correction to you, any kind of accusations or conviction about what you haven't been doing, let's start with a baseline here and just let you know I've loved you. I, I've cared for you. I've protected you. I've watched out for you. God says it. But just like the people of Israel, we have a problem and trusting in the love of God. And so exactly what happened to them is what happens to us many times. They asked, but you asked, how have you loved us? So immediately, the Israelites are questioning the love of God. Now, this unusual format of writing is found throughout the book of Malachi, and you're going to see it repeated again and again and again. God speaks, and then God gives an answer or another question that Israel would ask about what God has just said. God said, I loved you. And God says, but I know, I know you. You're going to ask, how have you loved us? We're, we're, we're found in this place where we live in a condition where we doubt the love of God for us. We, we doubt his goodness for us. And so sometimes we're hindered in praying prayers like, God, would you provide an abundance so that I have so much blessing I don't have room enough for it? Well, well maybe God doesn't want to do that. So maybe I'm just going to pray, God, help me make it today. Or, or we, we hear God's promises says, I'm going to provide healing to you because I'm the God who heals you. And we're like, okay, well, well God, could you, just, could you just make the pain go away? I, I know that it would be a lot to ask if you just 
totally heal me of this, so could you, just, could you just help me a little bit? Could you just get me out of this bind that I'm in? And we, we have these very timid and, and prayers that frankly insult the glory of God. We live lives that don't reflect that we believe God is as big as he is because we doubt his love for us. I mean, if we're just being honest, that's what happened with Adam and Eve. They're in the garden there. The enemy came, and he whispered to Eve, and he said, hey, did, did God really say you shouldn't touch every tree in the garden and that you, you shouldn't eat of it? And she said, well, yeah. And, and he says, well, God doesn't want you to be like him. God knows that when you eat from the fruit of the tree, you're going to be like him, knowing good and evil. And immediately this doubt entered in. And it's carried in our lives today, this doubt that we're like, well, maybe God isn't as good as he said he is. Maybe God isn't as loving as he said he is. Maybe God isn't who his word says he is. And so God backs it up, and he's having this conversation with them, and he says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Now, let me just roll it back here, just make sure you get this, okay? He said this, but you ask, how have you loved us? And then his answer is this right here. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Here's, in today's terms, he said, was not the Chick-fil-A sandwich better than the Popeye sandwich? <laughs> didn't, I, didn't I hate Popeye's and I love Chick-fil-A because they're closed on Sunday? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go on social media this week. <laughs> Here's what he's saying, because they're brothers. Esau and Jacob are brothers. Jacob's name later changed to Israel, where the nation of Israel came from, which is where God is speaking to and he says, look, I chose you. See, that's the difference. That's how we know that God loved us, because God chose us. The scripture declares that God chose us. He predestined us to be conformed into the image of his son because he loved us. He died on the cross for us because he loved us. The gospel says you don't have to doubt that God loves you. God loves you unconditionally because. But then he goes on to say this, and he says, Yet I have loved Jacob and Esau I've hated, and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland. I want you to hear this. And left his inheritance to the desert jackals. What God is saying, and remember, God gets glorified when we're provided for. God is glorified when we're fully supplied. You understand that the way that the world would know a nation is a godly nation is that this nation would be provided for richly by God. But how would you know if you weren't a godly nation? Because he says, I'll turn it into a wasteland. See, God wants us to walk in blessing because it reflects on his nature. I like to say it like this right here. That God receives glory and honor when his people are blessed. God receives glory and honor. God gets glorified. People see God in the way that you and I live when we live under the blessing of God. After this, there's chapters of God bringing all kinds of accusations or conviction in areas where the nation of Israel had not, listen, they had not been obeying God. They kept disobeying him. And then to make matters worse is they would say, the reason why we're going through the bad things that we're going through is because God's not just. And God is like, y'all... Look, he says it right here. He says it like this. He says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Well, how have we worried him, you asked? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord and that he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? See, you're insulting my character. You're not obeying me. You're not living in the blessing that I've provided. And then in some way, you're saying that God hadn't showed up. Y'all about to get me fired up in here, God says. Y'all wearying me. Sorry about the y'all. I'm from Georgia. That's just the way we do that. Y'all got it coming. And over the next few chapters, God just begins to lay out all of the specific areas, whether it was adultery, it was divorce, it was greed, it was theft. I mean, he just goes out, he starts to list all of the areas where they've been disobedient. And then he comes to this really critical passage in Malachi chapter 3. And starting in verse 8, he says, return to me and I'll return to you. It's this, it's this great turn in the scripture there. Return to me and I'll return to you. And then they say, because God's doing this, well, how are we going to return to you? And he says, return to me in tithes and offerings. And then he gives this great promise in chapter 
3 and verse 10. He says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Once again, God's testifying that if you test me, trust in my love, be my people, obey my ways, I'm going to do things for you that the surrounding countries know that I'm the God over your life. He says, then all the nations will call you blessed. Then everybody will see that I'm the God of Israel, and yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. God makes a way. God provides in abundance. These are the promises that God gave to the nation of Israel. But in Christ, we are now inheriting what Christ has done for us. He's fulfilled the law on our behalf. And now we get to step into these blessings as we participate in Christ. See, God gives an amazing promise. He says, reverse your tight-fistedness and watch my open-handedness. Reverse the way that you've been living, open yourself up to me, and watch what I'll do. Watch how I'll provide. I'll show my glory through your life because I'm that kind of God. So let me just kind of break it down what a tithe is for you. This word tithe is found in here. Tithe simply means a tenth part. That's the definition of the word tithe. So if someone says, I'm going to bring a tithe to God, they're bringing 10% of their increase back to God, returning it to him, saying, God, I believe that you're my source. It came from you, and you simply asked me to participate in this relationship. My part of the relationship is that I bring that first part to you to say, God, thank you for being my God. It's found in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. It says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. I know some people right now, you're saying, Leviticus, bro, you're saying Mosaic law here, the law, we're, under, we're not under the law anymore. Well, let me just back you up for a second, okay? Let me kind of give you a little perspective on this. The tithe was found before the law existed. You can look back in Genesis. Abram, he brought a tithe of everything to the priest called Melchizedek, which is a type of Christ, before the law existed. What's something else that existed before the law and then it was written into the law? The Sabbath, right? And what did Jesus say about the Sabbath? He said the Sabbath, he says man wasn't created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for man. He's basically saying you're not there to serve the Sabbath and it be an inconvenience to you. The Sabbath is there, or the day of rest is what a Sabbath is. A day of rest is there because it's going to benefit you. God says I know that you need a day to rest So I need you to just shut down for a period of time, and then you can restart, and it's going to be good for you because the Sabbath is there to serve you. Guess what? You're not there to serve the tithe. The tithe is there to serve you. God said, I'm going to make a way for you to be blessed, and it's through this tithe, through bringing this tenth part, that you're going to experience this blessing. And the instructions is that it's holy to the Lord. It, It belongs to God. And so when I begin to tithe, I get to participate in God's economy over my life. My wife have been tithing, my wife and I have been tithing since before we were married. We've been married for 15 years, and I can't even remember what my life was like before I was tithing. My mom and dad used to give me an allowance. They'd give me in in a denomination where I had 10 of one thing, and I was able to bring it and give it to God because they wanted to teach me at a young age, listen, Everything that you get comes from God. You've got to remember to honor him because that's the only way that you're going to be blessed and the generations are going to be blessed through you because guess what? My wife and I are doing that with our children. Every time they receive birthday money, we say, now make sure you bring a tithe. Make sure you give God what belongs to him. Why? Because we know that's the way that we're blessed. We know that that's the way that we participate in God's economy. Let me give you three very important ideas about the tithe. The first one is this one right here. The tithe provides for God's work through his church. The tithe specifically provides for the needs of local churches. That's why God says, bring it into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. 
There's a place that people are going to be blessed in the earth through us. That was the calling that was on Abraham. Abraham's promise came to him. He got his name changed, and God said, you're blessed to be a blessing. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Guess what? The church is a place of blessing to others. It's where people receive Christ. It's where they get baptized. It's where they go to small groups and have their lives transformed in the context of relationships. It's where our children and our youth are raised up to follow Jesus and to know his word, begin to worship God. It's where generations are blessed. And we get to be a part of making that happen through the local church. You know that every single person who brings the tithe participates in this great blessing of being a blessing to our community and around the world. Every single person. I don't know if you know this about this church. This church is fully funded by people just giving free will offerings to God. There's no money we get from any government, any agency. There's nothing at all. It's fully funded by you. You make this happen. This is your stage. This is your table. This is your TV. Back behind here, the iPad is giving me problems today. That's your iPad. <laughs> I was watching a movie this summer with our children. My wife and I took the kids to go see a movie. At the end of the movie, everybody starts to get up, and there's... there's there's some music playing, and there's something happening on the screens, but everybody's leaving. You know, we saw all the stars in the movie. I mean, we saw the big names, all the people that we recognize and that we know. But all of a sudden, there was, there was these words that were just scrolling across the screen. And as these words are just scrolling across the screen, people are just getting up and leaving. You may have seen something like this before. In fact, you may have even recognized some of these names right here. These are the credits for what's happening here today. See, see, people in this church, they give, they sacrifice, they make it happen. And everything that this church does, all of the people that we're able to touch happens because of generous givers. These are the credits of this church right here. It's you. Thank you. Thank you for giving. You're the ones who make this possible. You're the ones. You're the ones who help feed hungry people in our community who help provide a place for kids to have a safe place to go trick-or-treating on Halloween. You're the ones who provide our youth an opportunity to find an environment where they're accepted and loved. They're not bullied and picked on. They can grow in their faith. You're the ones who are responsible for it. All of these people are making it happen. The second thing that happens through the tithe is simply this right here. The tithe teaches me to put God first. The tithe does something in my heart. The tithe works on my insides. The tithe gives me a firm place to grow in my faith. I discover how to put God first in my life through the tithe. In fact, the Living Bible says this so brilliantly in Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 23. It says it like this. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. The purpose of the tithe is to teach you to always put God first. It's amazing what begins to happen when you put God first. Uh, Let me illustrate the tithe like this. I'm going to invite our team to come out right now and begin to help me with this illustration. I want you to see very specifically what it looks like when we begin to bring a tithe to God. You see, we got a pineapple right here. We got one pineapple goes to God. It's a tithe that goes first. And then we've got, what, nine pineapples remaining that we get to keep. Oh, and we got God here. We're going to give God the first part. We're going to give him a bunch of grapes. Come on, those are sweet sapphire premium black seedless grapes. And then we all of a sudden, we get to keep nine bags of grapes. You're going to start seeing how the blessings begin to overflow in our lives. God likes, God likes uh, celery. Hey there, hey there, celery. Nice, crunchy, healthy snack. Virtually no calories. Look at this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God's bringing nine, nine, count it, nine things of celery into our lives. We bring God the first part. Come on, we bring God some oranges. And God says, bam, I got you, bro. I got you. I'm taking care of you. See, when we honor God with the onions, watch out, God breath over here, we get nine, nine bags of onions over here. We'll be cooking good cooking up some stir fry with some onions. What else do we got? We're bringing God a tithe. Potatoes in the house. All right, all right. We've got some potatoes in the house. Watch out. God is bringing it in abundance over here. We're going to, wow, we're getting piled up over here. 
God is taking care of us, man. We're making it. You understand? You bring God the first part. Come on. And God begins to take care of the rest. You bring God the first and the best part. Come on. You bring God the first and the best part so he can bless the rest. You bring God the, old, the, the, the Zima tomatoes. Watch out. Zima in the house of the Lord here. Okay? Come on, man. And where are we going to put all this blessing? Man, it looks like we're starting to overflow. Come on, God says, I'm going to pour out so much blessing for you. You won't have room enough for it. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to provide. Look at this. Don't put those things on the table because they'll roll off. Man, we got, we got, what are those things? Some kind of melon. I forget what they're called. They're called uh, cantaloupes is what they're called. I knew that. I knew that. Wow, God, whoa, we got mangoes in the house. Somebody, somebody better bring God a mango. Wait a minute, we didn't bring God his mango first. Y'all better back that thing up. Come on, take care of God. We need a tithe over in this place. We need a tithe. My goodness. Woo. All right, we're going to bring a double tithe because we missed it on that paycheck right there. We missed it on that paycheck. You understand, this is what we believe. We participate in this with God. You know, you know what a handshake is? A handshake is an agreement that people make. You know that God has extended his handshake out to you and I, and all we have to do is reach forward and grab a hold of it and say, yes, God, I believe. Yes, God, I'm going to trust you. Don't be like Andrew Luck say, I'll play for, oh, just playing. I ain't playing. So some of y'all didn't even hear the news yet, man. Andrew Luck said, no, nah, nah, I'm not playing anymore. Fantasy football owners everywhere said, oh. Y'all ain't following me, man. I'm telling you, I'm dropping it. I'm dropping it like it's, like it's current events in this place. Jesus said it like this. He, he kind of backed up this idea. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he said, but seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Put God first, and all of these things that you've been lacking and needing will be added to you as well. Put the tithe first, and watch how God blesses in abundance. Listen, living a God-first life is about order and obedience. It's about order. Order matters. You know what's happened to today? Right now, as we speak right here, right now, the PGA Tour Championship is happening right now. It's a golf tournament. And the guy who wins first place gets $15 million. $15 million large. That's, That's a paycheck right there. Listen. If y'all want to win the PGA Tour Championship, just make sure you're tithing at Living Water, okay? (laughs) Calculate that. Yes, oh yes, Lord, 1.5 million. We will receive it, and we will pray for blessing and abundance. That's right, that's right. But you know who, the guy who gets second place, okay? This is just one place below, gets a measly $5 million. There's a $10 million gap between first place and second place. See, what Jesus is saying here is putting God first is essential because you show that you value God in that moment, that you're putting him at the highest place, that you're saying, I got to make sure that God is getting first. See, it's easy nowadays because when my wife and I get paid, we get paid and we notified in our bank, hey, it's been direct deposited in there. And guess what we do immediately? We go and tithe out of that. Sometimes people even automate that. So as as soon as it hits the day of the month, they can immediately make sure that the tithe is happening. Our our giving system has that capability if you want to do that. You can give by way of text message. You can go online and do it. Or you do it like my parents used to do it, write out the check, and you drop it right there in the envelope. Here's what my mom and dad would do. Because they want to put God first, I remember my dad, he would sit down and he would do all the bills for the month. And before he wrote any bills checks out, he would write the tithe check out to the church that he attended take it out, and he would put it in his Bible so he could bring it on Sunday. Why? My dad could have ta- wrote, wrote that on Saturday night before he went to church. Why would he do that first? Listen, by faith, he was saying, God, before I look at any of these other things that I have obligations or abilities to do, God, I want to make sure that I'm putting you first because it's a matter of the heart. It's a heart posture that when we say we're putting God first, we're honoring him, and then he says, I'm going to bless the rest. I'm going to take care of you. Some people say, Pastor, I love this idea. I love seeing this, and I'll definitely love seeing that. Bring me some more of that. 
but I don't have enough money to tithe. I've been, I've been trying, and I just can't find a place in the budget. Here's the beauty about putting God first. You give God an opportunity to come through and bless you with the rest of what you need. I know it's a big step of faith to say, 10%? Are you kidding me? Are you talking about gross net? What are you talking about here? I'm talking about put God first. Honor him and watch him. I've been told for years you can't ever outgive God. But here's what happens. We wait until we feel like we have enough to obey God. God says, I want you to obey first and then watch what I do on the other side. God says it. It's his word. It's just like any other act of faith. We trust him before we see it. Martin Luther King Jr. said, faith is like a staircase. You're, you're taking a step before you see the whole staircase. You're, you're just taking a step and just saying, I'm going to believe that God's going to meet me there. I'm going to trust that God's going to come through for me. But I understand there's some of us, because of decisions that we've made, situations that have come up in our lives, bills, medical, divorce, whatever it might be, has created a situation where it feels like there's just no way. And that's why at our church, one of our groups is Financial Peace University. Financial Peace University is there to train and teach how we can live on the 90% and make sure that we're honor God with the 10%, all the while being wise managers of what God has entrusted to our care. I want you to take a look at this commercial for Financial Peace University. Most stories that have a happy ending don't feel like it along the way. We borrowed for everything. Want a new couch? Go finance it. Want a new TV? Go finance it. Want a new car? Go finance it. My whole philosophy was credit cards. I'll just work another week. <sighs> Swipe the card. Everything kind of started to crash. We started to see our marriage drop away. I personally owed $750,000 in debt. I was totally hopeless. You need to decide if you want to be wealthy or if you want to look wealthy. When somebody told me about FPU, I grabbed hold of it like a life preserver. It gave me hope that we could make our marriage work. Knowing where your money's going is a huge life changer. Nobody owns me anymore. Nobody. It just opened up communication big time. All of a sudden, we were back together on a crusade. We changed our family tree. I'm here to do my debt-free screen. Yeah, how much have you paid off? Four hundred and fifty-six thousand. Eighty-nine thousand. One hundred and twenty thousand. Three hundred ninety-four thousand dollars. Three, two, two one. one. Woo! Woo! This financial peace stuff is working. People are getting out of debt and they're becoming millionaires. We are the first generation that are millionaires, and we've given more than we ever imagined we could yeah. give. I now have a net worth of $1.7 million. Hope is real. Listen, the church wants to equip the body of believers so that we can obey God together. And if finances are holding you back from being obedient to God, get the help that you need. In fact, today, Tim is out at the Financial Peace University table, and we have a group that's launching in just a few weeks. You can find the table because there's a tree with money growing on it. Because God provides generously for people who are going to use what he's entrusted to their care wisely. And we want you to live that kind of way. And we want you to know that God is for you. The third and the final thing that the tithe does for us is this. The tithe increases my faith in God. When God shows up, it's amazing. It's like he did it. He promised he would do it. I doubted him, but I stepped out in faith and he did it. it he does it. I could, I could share with you countless testimonies stories from real people just like you who thought there's no way I could do it and all of a sudden God did it and it's like now I got faith to believe for this now I got faith I can witness to people now I got faith that I can pray now I got a faith that I can read God's word now I got faith that I can raise my children in a godly household now I got faith that I can overcome that addiction why because tithing taught me that God is trustworthy tithing showed God's faithfulness and I knew that he'd come through for me, and I know he'll come through for you. So here's what I want you to do. I want to invite our host to come right now. 
And they're going to come with an envelope. And I'm going to ask everybody to write something down in the envelope. You're not going to have to write your name on it. No one's going to follow back up with you. This is just between you and God. It's a mechanism or a device for you to respond and make a spiritual decision about your posture of your heart today. And so our hosts are going to come to the front of each of the aisles, and when they reach there, they're going to have some envelopes in their hands, and I'd like if everybody could have one of these envelopes in their hands right now, if everybody could. I promise you're not going to get embarrassed. No, no, it's not going to bite you if you take it. You're not going to get bitten by a tithe, you know, check when it comes. You're just, you literally could just take the envelope and just receive it. So they're going to walk up the aisles right now. Lift up your hand if you need an envelope. Some of you received one when you came in today, and so you can use that one that you received when you came in today. And if you're just looking at the envelope, on the back side of it is a great little promise that you can take a picture of, that you could put inside your checkbook, put by where you pay your bills, and you just quote this promise. It's a paraphrased version of Malachi chapter 3. It says, the windows of heaven are open over me. Blessings are being poured out. God himself has rebuked the devourer for my sake. The fruit of my ground will not be destroyed. The vine won't fail to bear fruit in the field. Nations will call me blessed. I will be a delightful land today. I am experiencing God's supernatural increase, and I walk in it by faith. I'm a tither, I'm a giver, and I am blessed. It's a great statement to read over your finances, to read with your prayer time, get with your spouse, read it together, declare it over your life, say yes, we are living in God's abundance. We're not gonna find shortfall this month. God is taking care of us. We've been tithing and trusting him. Here's what I want you to know. If you begin tithing and you feel like God has disappointed you, just come back. We kind of have like this no, no doubt guarantee, this 90-day tithe challenge we've, cut, we've called it in the past. And if you want more information about setting it up, you can find out more information about it by contacting our office and we'll get you set up with it. But listen, we believe so much that God's going to take care of you. Look, if he doesn't come through, we'll give you your money back. You know what, we've offered this before, and nobody's ever come and said, you know what, God let me down. God didn't provide. Listen, tithing people test God. They test him. He says, test me in this and see if I will not. And he does it every single time. So everybody's got an envelope in your hand. Here's what I want you to do. Respond three ways, one of three ways. The first way is put the letter A on it. A means I'm already a tither. I've already been tithing. In fact, I brought my tithe when I came today. I'm going to bring it next week because it's the first of the month. I'm a tither. I'm already tithing. We're not going to take names. No, you don't have to write your name on this. This is just for you, just to benefit your faith. B simply means I'm beginning to tithe today. Maybe I was tithing in the past, but I've fallen away from it, and I'm going to begin again. I'm going to begin again. So I'm, I'm beginning to tithe. And then C means I'm going to commit to tithe for the first time. Maybe you've never tithed before. You heard this message and you saw this table full and you said, I believe God could do that for me. I'm going to commit to tithing. I'm going to put a C on it. So A, you're already tithing. B, you've tithed in the past. You're going to recommit to tithing or you're going to begin tithing again. And C is I'm a brand new tither. And next Sunday, Pastor, it's the first of the month, and I'm going to bring my tithe, and I'm going to watch God pour out blessing in my life. Come on, I'm going to pray over our decision today as you're writing this on the envelope here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing being poured out in our lives. God, I expect to hear testimonies and stories from our church family of how you've been so faithful. God, we are tithers, and we are blessed. We will be a delightful land. God, blessings are being poured out in our lives. God, because of our partnership, our covenant with you. God, we thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hosts are also getting ready, and they're going to come back with a container. And if you're ready to give today, some of you already came ready to give, and you could do that. If you, if you maybe want to get ready to give now, if God's prompting you to do that, you can. I'm not expecting somebody to just be able to bring a tithe like that. 
takes a little bit of calculation usually to try to figure out what that is. Here's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see our whole church just bring a tithe on September the 1st. It's next Sunday. I'd love to see us all come together and say, what would God do? What kind of blessing would God begin to pour out if we all decided to bring the tithe and honor him? Oh, man, I'd love it. I'd love it. First service, I was talking to some people who have been a part of this church for 30 and 40 years. Our church is only about 46 years old. Some of these people have been there almost the entire journey of this church. They got to be a part of all of the ministry of this church. That's what I want to do. I want to look back at my life and I want to say, look at what I did to build the kingdom of God. Look what I did to see people one into heaven. Look what I did. Look what I was a part of. I built something that is never going to spoil or fade. It is always forever going to continue on. It's God's kingdom. It's God's people. And it's people being ministered to in the name of Jesus. That's what I'm excited about. So I want to pray over our giving today as we just ask for the Lord's blessing on our giving. And if you wrote that letter on that envelope, you can just drop the envelopes in there. Whether you wrote anything else on there or not, you don't have to put anything in it. You just, everybody just put it in there. And we're just going to see God do something great through these commitments. Can we pray together? Father, over this giving, God, we ask for your multiplication effect. God, that you'll take what's given, just like the little boy did with his lunch. And that you fed 5,000 people with it because it multiplied in your hands. God, would you multiply our giving today? God, would you let it feed millions? Spiritual nourishment, living water for people who need Jesus in their lives. God, let generations be changed. God, pour out blessing into our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Our coasts are going to come right now and they're going to pass that container through your row. I love times like this as a church where we just get to say, God, we're doing it your way. This isn't something I came up with. This isn't something that I'm clever enough to discover. This is God's way. God said, I put it together this way, and you watch what happens when we do it God's way. I'm excited. Oh, my faith is built up, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm so appreciative of what God's doing here. In just a few weeks, Pastor Dillip will be here leading worship, man. We're seeing God's promises come to fruition, guys. We're seeing it happen, and I believe that God's going to continue to do even greater things than this. Even greater things than this. Amen. Here's what I do know, though. I do know there may be some people in this room that you're far from God right now. This whole message you've been hearing, just this emptiness cry out in your own soul, saying, I need God. I'm not right with God. Let me tell you, Jesus, God's one and only son, he came into the world not to condemn the world, but so through him that we might have life. That whosoever wants you to be set free, he wants you to walk in a greater level of anointing and power for your life than ever before. And it all starts with the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room with me right now? We just have a moment to just say, yes, God, I want you in my life. Maybe you're here today, and you know, I need Jesus. I need salvation. I need to be made new. I got an ugly past. I got some stuff that I want to leave behind. I want God to be the Lord of my life. If that's you today, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand, and you put it right back down. On the count of three, one, two, three. Three, all across this room, you're just saying, I want Jesus in my life. Yes, see that hand. I see those hands. Wow, yes, yes. A dozen hands went up or so. You can put them right back down. I want everybody under the sound of my voice to repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for my sins and you rose from the dead so I could have new life. I believe. Change me today. Give me a new start. Be the Lord of my life. I'll follow you wherever you tell me to go. In Jesus' name.